Before I introduce the two speakers today, um, I'd like to take this opportunity of thanking uh, Lewis, Anna, and Yoni for this uh, wonderful uh, 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 very, very informative uh, program. And uh, the one that I'm sure the young students that are attending and the oldest. The older scholars as well it will retain as something of value and I will talk to the people, whatever direction you say the subject will be taken. Uh, I'd also like to take this opportunity to remember Ronnie, um, who, as you just pointed out, was one of the instigator trustees because the chief instigator of this um, program and uh, um, who we saw uh, one of the pictures yesterday. Um, and uh, we certainly missed here, and um, uh, I had the, the wonderful opportunity of working with Ronnie for a number of years in the 1990s at Darwin and uh, and I remember that as a wonderful experience in terms of seeing firsthand the fire of his imagination and uh, the scope of his knowledge and his unique way of looking at things and uh, certainly Ronnie um, uh, represented what many people talk about in the first day of the conference of the meeting um, of the importance of uh, applying, making use of people about local studies in uh, understanding the crusade and uh, understanding the history of the crusades, what they're doing with uh, Whatever aspect of the crusades are dealing with, the importance of archaeology is expanding our knowledge. It's, it's something fundamental and something that Ronnie really represented in this work. On the lighter notes, it took me that this final session to speak with today uh, represents two themes that are essential to the life of any cultured society. One uh, somewhat esoteric. The other entirely practical art on the one hand and money on the other. <laughs> uh, and the great Irish wit Oscar Wilde wrote, art is quite useless, but so, but also, so is a crowd. And uh, uh, in, in its unique way, he was saying that art is not practical, but it is desirable and even essential. And to put another thing to bit, just from an American Groucho Marx. The great money, he said, money frees you from doing the things you dislike. And since I dislike doing nearly everything, that is handy. It does allude to the importance of uh, the role there of money, which is true <clears throat> in the 12th and 13th centuries of this today. So these are the two topics we're going to be hearing about art, sublime, exalted, praiseworthy, and of course, not really useless at all. But playing an essential role in human life and culture, and certainly, certainly in the art of the Middle Ages, money, practical, somewhat vulgar, but very, very essential. And both art and money are important windows in our understanding of the society of the Latin East, and indeed the East society. And hence, the study of these two topics is crucial to our comprehension um, of the society. Our first speaker today, who's going to speak about art, is uh, Dr. Gil Fischoff. Gil features medieval art and, and medieval art, crusader art, uh, art history in the Department of Art History at the University of Haifa. Uh, as an art historian, he specializes in French uh, Romanesque art and crusader art, and much of his research is devoted to monumental art, patronage, competition between holy sites. The formation of identity uh, through and of institutional identity through the creation of foundation methods. The studies include a uh, consideration of the mural cycle of the Church of the Maus, uh, up the block, and the Upper Bloch, and the Hospital of Patron, and the art of the Church of the Annunciation in Nazareth. And this topic today is a very fundamental one. What is Crusader without Crusader art? Thank you. Thank you, Bill Adria. Um, I will try to show that uh, art in the Crusader kingdom had 
uh, roles that were very uh, that were far from sublime was very much involved in the dirty business of competition between uh, rival sites so we'll delve into that in a moment um i would like to start by thanking iris jonathan and anna for organizing this uh, whole wonderful week i wish i could have attended um uh, for the duration of the week and i would uh, you mentioned other you mentioned Roni, the Roni. I would like to uh, mention also uh, Robert Usterhut, who uh, a great scholar of uh, Byzantine art and archaeology, who passed away sadly a few weeks ago, and uh, he was a dear friend and mentor, and he will be much uh, missed. <clears throat> the very notion of the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem as a Crusader state is being increasingly challenged in current scholarship. In a recent study, Christopher McAvitt traced the historiography of the notion of a crusader state and observed that in much of the scholarly discussion, the distinction between the crusades themselves as armed expeditions and between the society ruled by the Franks in the Latin Kingdom has become blurred, with the history of both having become almost synonymous. This has in part been caused by the researchers' perception of the Latin states as an extension of Western Europe, reinforced by the recurrent crusading expeditions. According to McAvitt, the results of this solar scholarly conflation were crucial since, since it, and I quote, divorced the Kingdom of Jerusalem and the other Frankish principalities from the larger Middle Eastern world, thereby implicitly promoting a facile clash of civilization model. This centuries-old conflation of kingdom and crusade and the subsequent use of the name uh, crusader states assimilate two very different histories. And by studying the, uh, that society as a part of the crusades, historians implicitly suggest that the ideology that undergirded the crusades also undergirded Frankish society, end of quote. In the field of art history as well, a review of the historiography reveals a similar phenomenon. Thus far, many of the interpretations of pictorial cycles created in the Latin Kingdom or in other crusader contexts have tended to present a reading of their iconography, deciphering triumphant crusading ideas that <clears throat> contrast the heroic Christian with the monstrous Muslim. A good example of this are the famous Nazareth capitals. On display in the Franciscan Museum of the Church of the Annunciation in Nazareth are the five capitals originating from the Crusader Church of the Annunciation that were discovered in 1908 by Father Prosper Vio. Alongside additional figural fragments discovered by Bellarmino Bagatti during the excavations carried out in the 1950s and 60s. All five capitals were found almost undamaged buried in a small grotto outside the north portal of the Crusader church. The uh, extraordinarily fine condition has suggested to many scholars that the capitals had never been exposed to weathering and thus that they were never uh, installed in their intended location. Seeing in this an indication that the capitals had been intentionally hidden away for protection as the threat of Muslim conquest increased in the last year of the Latin Kingdom, several scholars, including uh, Paul de Cham, Tom Bowes, Alan Borg, and others, have suggested a late date for the capitals, the uh, 1170s or 80s. Joshua, Joshua uh, sorry, Jaroslav Folda, who dedicated a monograph to the capitals, argues that the almost pristine capitals belonged to a never completed uh, decula above the shrine grotto inside. Zehava Jacobi has suggested a completely different location for the capitals as that of the west portal of the church, mounting the colonnettes, supporting the lintel and archivolts and surmounting the jump statues on either side. On stylistic grounds, she dated the west portal with its capitals to the mid 12th century. Four of the Nazareth capitals are polygonal, polygonal and one is rectangular. Set <coughs> under elaborate architectural canopies, the four uh, polygonal capitals present scenes from the life of the apostle Matthew, Thomas, Peter, and James the Great. While some of the scenes are traditional, 
such as the doubting Thomas that we see uh, before us and the martyr martyrdom of James, others display an extremely rare iconography and reveal an emphasis on episodes of the ministry of the apostles and their mission to the far corners of the earth. A good example is that of the Matthew capital before you that depicts scenes from his mission to Ethiopia. As far as I know, this is the only representation of these scenes in medieval monumental art. Among the subjects uh, depicted are the confrontation of the saint with two sorcerers and many other rare um, scenes. One of the most challenging questions concerning these capitals re uh, relates to the choice to depict a cycle of the apostles rather than, for example, a Marian cycle, which would have been directly connected to the holy site of the Annunciation. And indeed, several scholars have understood the appearance of the apostles on the capitals and the emphasis on their mission uh, in the East in relation to there being biblical models for the crusaders and the crusading mission. Thus, both has suggested that the iconography of the Nazareth capitals is an expression of 12th century interests in the East. Later, Moshe Barash expanded upon this interpretation and suggested that the choice of the apostles gave legitimation to the crusader settlement in the Holy Land. Much uh, more recently, Lucy Ann Hunt has suggested that the cycle as a whole should be interpreted in a context of a mission to convert the Muslims. Many of the interpretations of the rectangular capital from the Church of the Annunciation follow a similar path. The rectangular capital presents a crowned female figure leading a nimbed male figure by the hand in the midst of four terrible demons holding bows and other weapons. The scene has often been identified as that of Ecclesia, Faith, or the Virgin Mary, leading an apostle or a believer to safety. Moshe Barash has suggested that the choice in this scene may have been related to the growing Muslim threat in the last years of the Latin Kingdom, and that the allegorical figures may also have had a more specific meaning as a representation of the frightened Christian community in Nazareth being led to safety by the church. For Barash, therefore, the images of the demons are associated with the Muslims. More recently, Lucian Hand has suggested that the male figure can be understood as a missionary in his attempts to convert the pagans, assisted by the church as he faces the menaces of war and idolatry. Uh, it is in this light that Hunt interprets the exceptional portrayal of the four demons, which she regards as an image of the Muslims uh, who attack the church and its missionaries. While their faces are those of hideous, grotesque uh, demons, thus expressing their corrupt and indeed monstrous nature, their bodies are those of, of naked males, presenting <clears throat> qualities of almost classical beauty in the contraposto of the body and the detailed even sensuous elaboration of the muscles. While seen is in such a quotation of antique sculpture, also, um, excuse me, while seen is such quotation of antique sculpture, also a possible allusion to the paganism, the, uh, the accusation of which was often directed at Islam, and suggests that it was meant to portray the seductive nature of Islamic evil. Returning to McAvitt, it can be suggested that the tendency to focus on interpretation of crusader iconography as manifesting triumphal notions is the art historical equivalent of the conflation between crusades as armed expeditions and the society in the Latin Kingdom that he has observed in crusader historiography. Consequently, much in the same way that McAvitt suggests that releasing the history of the Latin Kingdom from the grip of the crusading expedition expeditions will enable its study in connection to the Middle Eastern surroundings, <laughs> releasing the interpretation of crusader art from the overriding force of triumphant crusading ideology will enable its interpretation as an expression of the political, economic, and social situation that existed within the complex society of the Latin Kingdom. My own research in recent years has tried to do exactly that focusing among others on the hospitaler mural cycle in uh, Emmaus of Gosh and on the images of St. Peter in Nazareth and other uh, sites as well. 
I would like to give an example of such an approach through my as yet unpublished study of the sculptural cycles of the capitals from the Cathedral of Sebaste, uh, anchoring their meaning in the ecclesiastical challenges facing the bishopric of Sebaste. The Cathedral of St. John the Baptist in Sebaste was built adjacent to the ancient Eastern Ro uh, Roman wall, uh, Roman wall. According to tradition, it marked the place to which the disciples had brought John's body after his beheading, and in which they had uh, buried his remains alongside those of the prophets uh, Elisha and uh, Ovadia. Around 808, however, the Commemoratorium de Cassis Dei reports that the cathedral was already in ruins, although apparently not the tomb itself, and that Bishop Basil and his clergy were serving at this time at a second church in the city, which was located at the place where the Baptists had been imprisoned and beheaded. And I quote, at Sebastia, where the body of St. John lies buried, there used to be a great church, but it has now fallen to the ground. All that is left is the place of the glorious Baptist's tomb, which has not been entirely destroyed. And the church where the prison was and where he was beheaded. There is a bishop, Basil, and 25 presbyters, monks, and clergy. The Commemoratorium de Cassis Dei thus presents us with an additional church dedicated to the Baptist in Sebaste, as well as with a second tradition linking the Baptist to the city situating the place of his imprisonment and execution in Sebastian. Both of these will be important for an evaluation of developments in Sebaste in the 12th century. The next step in the development of traditions in Sebaste occurred in the 12th century. While at the beginning of the 9th century, John's beheading was claimed to have taken place at the site of the church on the Acropolis Hill, Things seems to have changed after the establishment of the Latin Kingdom, as some pilgrim accounts began to locate John's prison and place of martyrdom, martyrdom at the cathedral, in addition to the presence of his tomb there. An early, an early examples come from Abba Daniel, who visited the city in uh, 1108, uh, 6 to 8, and who states that, and I quote, and there is a place here, two versts to the west of the town of Samaria called Sebastopolis. And there is a small enclosed um, place here, which was the prison of St. John the Baptizer of Christ. And this prison, John the Precursor of Christ was beheaded by King Herod. The tomb of John the Precursor is here. And there is a fine church dedicated to him. And there is a very rich Frankish monastery. What could have been the motivations behind the cathedral's appropriation of the tra tradition of the Baptist's prison and place of execution in direct conflict with the centuries old claims of the upper church? I suggest that this may be related to its ecclesiastical status in light of the crusader reorganization of the structure of diocese in the Holy Land. Although Sebaste fell to crusader hands already in 1099, there is no mention of a Latin bishop in the, city in the very early years of the kingdom. And the status of the Latin religious establishment there is not clear. However, as late as uh, 1129, a Latin bishop was instated in the city as the Bishop Baldwin of Sebaste is mentioned in a royal charter drawn up in that year. The fact that the Crusaders chose to reinstate a Latin bishop in Sebaste is important. When structuring their patriarchate, the Crusaders modeled it on the structure of the Byzantine patriarchate that they had inherited. Thus, all the provinces of the Byzantine patriarchate were restored except for one. Regarding dioceses, the Franks were aware of the traditional Byzantine structure, and when changing it, were aware that they were creating an innovation. However, the full scope of the Orthodox Byzantine hierarchy could not be recreated, and the 13 Frankish dioceses that were created replaced the 100, more than 100 Orthodox dioceses. As Bernard Hamilton and uh, Andrew Jotitsky have shown, in choosing the location of their sees from the many possible options held by bishop in the Byzantine period, 
the Franks were guided by two considerations. Some were chosen because of their military or administrative importance, while others were important shrines and pilgrimage churches. Under the Byzantine Patriarchate, there was a bishop at Sebaste who was a suffragan of the see of uh, Caesarea, thereby making the, uh, instate, the instatement of a Latin bishop a continuation of the traditional Byzantine custom. However, the economic and political reality in the region had changed, as in the 12th century, Sebaste was far less important than Nablus, which was the administrative center of the region. Moreover, as Bernard Hamilton and uh, Andrew Yotitsky had noted, Sebaste was the only seed that the Franks uh, revived out of the 27 suffragan seas of Caesarea in the Byzantine period. And it is plausible that Sebaste was considered more fitting than any of the suffragan seas of Caesarea because it was an important shrine connected to the Baptist. Now the connection to the Baptist and the possession of his relics were therefore of the highest importance to the Latin bishops of Sebaste, providing the foundation for both their ecclesiastical status during the Latin kingdom on and for their financial strength, through the revenues from pilgrims, as well as uh, fundraising efforts in the West, studying at length and published by Professor Kedar. The appropriation of the tradition of the site of John's prison and beheading by the soon to be re-established bishopric of Sebaste would strength, certainly strengthen the church's position in its successful struggle to be re-established as a cathedral and can be con considered as part of its effort to gain recognition. Thus the identification of the cathedral as the place of both the Baptist's tomb and the site of his prison and execution had direct and significant political implications for the Latin bishops, being at the very root of the foundation of the Latin bishopric there. A spectacular development in the fate of Sebastian Cathedral occurred in 1145, uh, when a silver reliquary containing the remains of John the Baptist, the prophets Obadiah and Elisha, and many other prophets and patriarch was miraculously, miraculously discovered uh, again published by Kedar. While uh, uh, William of Flanders, Patriarch of Jerusalem, announced the discovery of the prelates, uh, to the prelates uh, of the West, declared that he had established an annual feast to commemorate the discovery and promised the remission of 40 days penance to all who would contribute to rebuilding the rebuilding of the church and visit the place of discovery on three feasts the newly established feast commemorating the discovery of the relics and the feast of John's birth and uh, of his execution. I believe that this spectacular development was declared also visually in the sculptural programs of the cathedral. Four capitals originating from the cathedral of Sebaste were brought to Istanbul in uh, 1897 and are exhibited in the archeological museum. As convincingly shown by David Walsh, the capitals were cut in such a manner as to fit a portal structure and were placed on the displayed jumps on either side of the west portal of the cathedral. These form a cycle from the life of the Baptist. It should be noted, however, that this co contended provenance of the capitals from the portal is not universally accepted. Uh, and Nurit Kenan Kedare suggested that the capitals could have originated from somewhere else in the cathedral or its vicinity, so, uh, such as from the blind arches of the Shevet. Beginning the sequence uh, on the outer splay jumps uh, of the left side of the portal, the capital depicts Herod's banquet. The bearded and crowned figure of Herod it's, is seated at a covered table with three other figures by his sides. The one on his right is clearly female, female. As there is no indication of the platter with John's head, this is clearly not the scene of the presentation of the head of the Baptist after his execution, but the earlier scene of the feast, and it therefore begins the narrative. The next capital placed on the middle uh, splay jump uh, of the left side of the portal, depicts Salome's dance. Salome is accompanied here by a group of musicians. 
Uh, on the far left is a flutist holding the flute with both hands and blowing it powerfully. Next to him is a player of another musical instrument, possibly a Sanietes. The figure of Salome is depicted next. Her ecstatic dancing is conveyed through her posture with her knees bent and her torso turned in the opposite uh, direction to that of her legs, conveying her sexual sexuality, excuse me, and marking her as a temperess, temperess associated with the scene of lust. The last figure on the capital is that of a drum player whose instrument is held by two straps tied around his neck. The next capital is made of limestone and is rectangular in shape. The imagery on the capital is carved on two adjacent facets. The beheading of John the Baptist is depicted on the larger facet of the capital. A bearded Saint John uh, adorned with a nimbus is on his knees his executioner towers over him with his sword in hand, grabbing the Baptist by his hair. On the adjacent narrower facet of the rectangular capital, the soul of the Baptist is being transported to heaven, port portrayed as a small naked figure born in a cloth by an angel. Identification of the last surviving capital is less clear. A bust of a man occupies the center of the composition. His posture is frontal and hieratic, and in his left hand, he holds a closed book. The position of his right hand cannot be determined any longer, but it possibly held another object, object or perhaps made a gesture of blessing. He wears a prominent cloak across his shoulders. Two additional, additional figures seem subordinated to him. To his left, a smaller figure is kneeling, holding an object in his lap, while to his right, uh, and not uh, viewed from this uh, angle, uh, while to his right, a second smaller figure also holds an object, uh, grasping it with a cloth and thus indicating it as a sacred object. The entire group is located above a row of cantus leaves, which also spring from behind. Uh, which also spring from behind them. On the far right uh, of the composition, a crouching lion is perched on the foliage. As far as I am aware, a Welsh is the only scholar to date to have attempted identification of the scene, but did not reach any conclusion. I would like to identify the scene as depicting the newly discovered remains of John the Baptist being presented to an ecclesiastic or a high ranking dignitary plausibly the Bishop of Sebastian. This accords well both with the uh, fact that the central figure is not named and therefore not a saintly figure, as well as with the kneeling posture of one of the subordinate figures and the sacred object held with cover hand, covered hands by his uh, companion. I would add that my, my uh, late mentor, Professor Nurit Lankedar, has identified a similar scene uh, at uh, Sanz Cathedral, which has very close ties to Sebastian uh, Cathedral, but this is beyond the scope of the present uh, presentation. We can now ask how this sculptural ensemble can be understood in the context of the cathedral's attempts to attract pilgrims and raise funds as well as in the context of the cathedral's efforts to elevate its status and prestige. Several observations can be made. At the very first level, the portal of Sebastian Cathedral presents an event that in the 12th century was relocated and claimed to have taken place on the site of the cathedral, namely John's decapitation. The, the portal can therefore be seen as a visual counterpart to the textual and oral efforts such as the mention of this tradition to pilgrims by the cathedral in order to strengthen its identification as the place of John's decapitation. Secondly, if my identification is correct, the cycle prominently displays the new event of the rediscovery of the Baptist's remains in 1145. It thus makes a clear attempt to make the discovery of the relics an inseparable part of the long narrative of the Baptist's life and martyrdom, thus integrating the discovery into his hagiography. 
The portal therefore takes part in the cathedral's efforts to establish the, dis the discovery of the Baptist relics as a major new and miraculous event, and thus to raise its own fame and prestige as the site of this occurrence and in possession of such <coughs> precious relics. <coughs> And massive project. <coughs> Just, I, I will have to take a one minute break. I think it's strange. I will uh, take one minute uh, break. And, uh, oh. Sorry, this was not part of the original. Mm. <laughs> oh, I you need something. Maybe we'll take a uh, two, two minutes break. Yes. 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 Oh. Yes, it's in the last Now, if you wait for too long, sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Oh. I will please five minutes. I'm I'm terribly sorry. Oh, okay, so so we we'll take it five minutes break. Okay, so if anyone wants the coffee or I Um, so I'm gonna after all this, I'm gonna go to the old city for a little bit. Nice. Yeah, I want to try to see the Tower of David Museum. Um, but also, you know, pick up some souvenirs for my family. What's that? Where did you go? I'm going to. Okay. Uh, now, how long are you staying here? Uh, I don't know. I know that the Tower of David Museum closes at four, and the trains stop running at like five forty. Yeah, I heard the train is not running today at all. The light rail stops at. Okay, I I like that. Yeah, that's what I mean. The train is Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I know I'm taking a cab to Tel Aviv, so okay. that's not that's not an issue yeah. for me. It's just mostly getting from the old city back to uh, yeah. Prima Park. As I also did, I think it was really nice to do uh, because my taxi leaves at three o'clock. They would tell me, yeah, they would have a good to nice place. Yeah, it's really bad because of the hotel drive. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because my flight's at 11.30, so just, yeah, yeah, it makes sense yeah. to be a little bit closer so then I can get to the airport in good time. I'm, I'm one of those people, it's like, if I'm not like three hours you know, early for my flight, I'm going to be late. <laughs> Despite I know the absurdity of that, it's, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And then just to have me like, well, we need to pat you down real quick. It's like, I don't have time for that. <laughs> um. 
my wife who has grown up around airplanes because her father works in you know air airline shipping and stuff like that is has a a bit more cavalier attitude towards you know getting there on time it's like yeah if you're a couple hours like at most you know that that you get there it's like okay it's like trust me i've i've I grew up in Miami airport. Like, I know. I know this tarmac. <laughs> no, no. It... It was hilarious. So Gainesville has its own airport. It's small. It recently expanded to five gates. It's had three for the longest time. Um, but, you know, it's just absolutely tiny. And we were flying out of Gainesville uh, to get a connecting flight elsewhere. And, you know, we left our house like maybe an hour before our flight. And I'm just like, oh, we're going to be late. We're going to miss our flight. And she's like, no, we're not. Like, security is going to take like two minutes tops. You know, it's like, trust me on this. It's like, I know we're going to, because we have to find parking and then we're going to, and, you know, we get there, we park immediately, we walk right in, just go through security. It's like that. And we still have like 30 minutes before like boarding even starts. And she looks at me, it's like, so we're going to be late, huh? <laughs> I mean, yeah. that's yeah. fair. Yeah. At least there's like nothing. Again, we small Yeah. 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 Yeah photos of um, all the guns and everything that they've confiscated and i find it hilarious because it's like you didn't stop a terrorist attack you stopped someone who forgot that they were concealed carrying <laughs> yeah no no i completely understand it's just you know a difference of attitude between my wife and myself when it comes to airplanes Okay. So sorry everyone, just an acute muscle cramp that has never happened to me before. So and I sounded like a depression, haven't I? <laughs> <laughs> and the, the, the funny thing that I've written on the side in Hebrew to, to take a small pose. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have this. You so. followed your own instructions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, I will try, and if something again will happen, then uh, Will and Benny have suggested winning it. I hope I will pull through. Okay, so returning to my um, uh, fundamental uh, question. I hope that this example has demonstrated the insights that can be gained about the meaning and motivations of crusader art uh, when we abandon the preconditioned search for a triumphant uh, meaning expressing a crusader ideology and try to study the monumental, monumental cycles of the Latin Kingdom in the context of the political and ecclesiastical structure of the kingdom itself. However, how decisive should this break from crusading ideology of uh, crusader uh, triumphalism be? Is there no room for interpretations looking to trace triumphant notions and the echoes of the struggle between Christianity and Islam in the art of the Latin kingdoms? Or in other words, what is crusader about crusader art? This question resonates even stronger in light of some of the criticism that McAvitt's approach has recently received. In recent criticism of uh, McAvitt's work, Andrew Buck has contended that while McAvitt may be correct in stressing the political pragmatism employed by the rulers of the Latin states and the lack of a clear crusading motivation behind some of the warfare propagated in the Latin East, in his rejection of the term crusader states, McAvitt did not take into account the intricate ways in which the crusading idea was digested, transmitted from generation to generation, commemorated by the Frankish inhabitants of the Latin East, and influenced their group identity. These included dynastical tradition and cultural memory, as well as liturgical commemoration and literary traditions. Thus, for example, Buck demonstrates that there was a clear interest in the Latin East in crusade songs and epic poems in the vernacular, which were an important means of propagation of the crusading idea. While most surviving vernacular responses to the crusades were created in the West, Buck introduces evidence of such works also being written in the East in the 12th century with the possibility that what little has survived is only the tip of the iceberg of many more songs commemorating the Crusades that were produced in the East. This attests to a sharing in the Latin East of the elite culture that spawned the Crusading songs, demonstrating that the epic Crusading past was actively transmitted and remembered by the Frankish society in the East, which shared the knightly values and courtly ideas flourishing in the West. For back therefore, the term crusader states return its value for scholars studying the Latin East as he determines that, and I quote, to propose that scholars detach the Latin East from crusading and the Latin West, thus ignores the important links between East and West, which went beyond the narrow scope of political relation, relations. Such a proposition creates an artificial binary, binary between a crusading as a Western phenomenon made manifest in penitential warfare and imbued with intolerance and distinct ideology from its inception, and the Latin East as an area of complex interchange and rough tolerance. Of course, he's hinting at Metaphysics book that way. Um, though these uh, were perhaps not crusading states, they were nevertheless states formed through crusade, a reality that was never forgotten." End of quote. Mm -hmm. Bearing this in mind, I return to my question, what is crusader about crusader art? I believe that both of the concepts of McAvitt and of Buck have their merits, but that in fact, in the interpretation of monumental cycles in the Latin kingdom, their approaches should not be seen as co contradictory but as complementary. I would like to suggest a new model, which I term the model of flexibility, according to which the specific imagery chosen at each site was selected precisely because it allowed simultaneous diverse meanings, often complementary and sometimes even contradictory, in a way that facilitated their acceptance by the vast and diverse array of patrons and audiences 
that characterize the heterogeneous society and complex social structure of the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem. In a world, world the selected images allowed sufficient flexibility of interpretation to accommodate for possible tensions or, di or differences in approach by the different groups of viewers or by the patrons themselves. Why this while this model, I believe, is valid for public monumental art in the Middle Ages in general, it is especially fitting for the art created by and for the heterogeneous society of the Latin Kingdom. Let's return to the rectangular capital from, Naz from Nazareth for an example. Alongside the triumphant readings prevalent in the historiography concerning the capitals, which I've mentioned at the beginning of this talk, other interpretations can be proposed. In a previous study, I have suggested that the iconography of the rectangular capital should be interpreted in light of the challenge that had been posed to Nazareth by the Church of St. Anne in Sepphoris, competing with Nazareth for, pig, for pilgrims and for prestige as a holy site associated with the Virgin Mary. Sepphoris has been associated associated from early times with the Virgin and her parents. In the sixth century, the pilgrim from Piacenza described relics of the Virgin found at Cephas. I quote, that Ptolemais will left the coast and travel into the Galilee region to a city called Diocesaria, Cephas, in which we venerated what they said was the flagon and the bread basket of St. Mary. The chair also was there on which she was sitting when the angel came to her. Turning to the 12th century, several sources uh, among them Todorik indicate that Saint Anne was born in Sepphoris, while John of Würzburg records that it was said that the Virgin Mary herself was born in Sepphoris. Sometime uh, in the middle or second half of the 12th century, a crusader church was built in Sepphoris. Its plan uh, cons uh, consisted in a nave and two aisles terminating in a tripartite absidial arrangement in its general outline, uh, and this was typical of crusader churches. Now, what was the purpose and function of this church, and what relation does it have with the traditions pertaining to St. Anne and the Virgin? Dennis Springle has contended that there is nothing about the building that indicates that it was constructed to mark a holy place, and therefore, the main function of the building would have been that of a parish church. However, both Jaroslav Polda and Esther Grabiner claim that several characteristics of the building suggest that it might have been intended to mark the holy site of St. Saint, Saint Anne's house. Among these characteristics, they mentioned a size of the church, which is, which is 30, 37 by 22 meters, which is very large for a village the size of Sepphoris. The unusual, b, the unusual richness of the architectural structure and the decoration of the eastern parts, and c, the reuse of many architectural elements, among them columns within the fabric of the Crusader Church, and this had both a practical as well as a symbolic pur purpose conferring among, upon the edifice an aura of antiquity and sacredness and a connection to the early church. When all this is considered, a picture emerges of a holy site created at Sepphoris and tradition that were cultivated and, com uh, and competed directly with those of Nazareth, especially in the claim that the Virgin was born in Sepphoris. And indeed, contrary to the claim at Sepphoris, Todorik describes how in the grotto of Nazareth, moreover to the right, there is to the south, there, uh, there is an arch structure having only a single cross engraved beneath it, in which the blessed mother of God, when she was born, came out of her mother's womb. This clash between the claims of the two sites was observed in the beginning of the 1170s by John of Würzburg, who, while noting that it was said that the Virgin Mary was born in Sepphoris, added that he understood from Jerome that the Virgin was born in Nazareth. I believe that the iconography of the rectangular capital responds to the challenges posed by Sepphoris. While, as we have seen, it had often been identified as an image of ecclesia or faith leading an apostle or a believer to safety, Jaroslav Folder has identified the image as that of the Virgin Mary, 
connecting it, connecting it to the Greek tradition of the descent of the Virgin into hell and her pleading on behalf of the tormented soul. The descent of the Virgin, of, not of Christ. If so, then the imagery of the rectangular capital places a considerable emphasis on the redemptive power of the Virgin, assisting those in need and having mercy even for sinners. Indeed, as this capital was, was installed in the Church of the Annunciation, the protective role of Mary referenced by this image could be understood as directed towards the pilgrims arriving at this holy sanctuary, thus making a strong visual claim about the benefits to be gained by those visit, visiting the Virgin Sanctuary in Nazareth. I believe that the attempts of Sepphoris to proclaim itself as an important Marian, Marian uh, center and the birthplace of the Virgin may have played a part in the choice of this iconography in Nazareth, which can be perceived as intended to respond to the challenges and competition which Sepphoris created for the cult of the Virgin in Nazareth. Now, as my model of flexibility suggests, this interpretation does not intend to negate the crusader or triumphant reading of the capital, but should be perceived as complementary. The unique and the original iconography of the capital is thus explained as resulting from a will to address the diverse spiritual goals and to communicate with the heterogeneous audiences of the Latin Kingdom, allowing for both a triumphant reading alongside a reading centered on the protective power of the Virgin responding to the claims of settlers. To conclude, what then is Crusader about Crusader art? In a monograph in 1994, Bianca Kunen set out to re-example the very notion of Crusader art, questioning whether it should be understood as a geographical, historical, or art historical concept. In the concluding chapter of her book, Kunel defines three characteristics of crusader art that enable its perception as an art historical term. A, a conscious, meaningful integration of forms from the artistic past of the Holy Land. B, respect for the locus sancta and demonstration of the meaning and unique tradition of each holy site. And C, manifestation of contemporary ideas and realities including political and geopolitical. I agree with Professor Kunel regarding the validity of all three of these points. I would however like to expand them to include a more specific characterization of crusader art as that which D includes iconographies that were sufficiently flexible to allow for a multi-layered reading. In other words, the specific imagery chosen at each site was selected precisely because it allowed simultaneous diverse meanings, often complementary and sometimes even contradictory, in a way that facilitated the acceptance by the vast and, diver and diverse array of patrons and audiences. E, crusader art as that which presents iconographies that allow for a reading that manifested the notion of the Christian holy uh, war and triumph, while at the same time, and this is the um, merging, if you would like, of McAvitt and Buck in its art uh, historical implication, while at the same time, and this, is, and this simultaneity is important, F, crusader art as that which presents iconographies that were rooted in and responsive to the local and regional challenges that each site experienced, which often resulted from, from the competition between the different local sancta and were rooted in the process of consolidation of the new kingdom and of the Latin patriarchy, such as the Latin reorganization of the structure of diocese in the Holy Land. Thus, crusader art was both triumphant and at the same time engaged in the local and regional real politic and daily challenges within the nascent society of the Latin kingdom. Is, it is this, perhaps, uh, this unique combination that made this art so original and innovative. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean, for that. Pushing through. <laughs> Pushing through. <laughs> um, do we have any questions? Yeah. 
Yes. Uh, um, thanks, Gil. That was so interesting and such really fascinating material. The, I, I'm I'm attracted to the idea that you propose of uh, uh, you know a new thinking about flexibility, uh, and maybe it's too early for you to uh, say about uh, whether you think that can that model works from you know the, the full period. But do you do you think? Or maybe that's the question. Do you think that that model applies for the duration of a period? Or do you think we, you can periodize, periodize it or nuance it more tightly and, and see that, for example, I don't know, uh, uh, a more um, a, a singular approach to the art in the earliest years and then a more expansive, flexible art in later years? Just So just that's the, an attempt thanks, to question thanks, that. Thanks, Leon. That's, that's a very, very wonderful, wonderful question. I believe that it applies for the whole duration, at least for the 12th century. I'm engaged with the 12th yeah. century. I don't want to make any decision about the 13th without seriously uh, examining it. But for the, the, the 12th century, I believe that it applies for the whole duration with the challenges being uh, nuanced throughout the, 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 the decades. Uh, I think that there are, for the example, if you think about uh, uh, the hospitalers, I, I haven't mentioned Abu Ghosh, uh, and which is my one of my major uh, um, studies uh, that I, I study. Um, if you think about their challenges in the uh, 70s, of course, it, 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 it uh, very much it, uh, evolved in competition with, with Tampa. So we have, I think, different um, challenges and different. Um, uh, I, I would say shifting uh, relations among the, the, the different institutions that um, uh, evolve in the kingdom. So, but as, uh, let's say, as a theoretical model, I would apply it. For example, uh, of course, I, I want to think more fully uh, on your question, but I would um, perhaps uh, suggest to look, for example, about how royal imagery in the first decades, to think about uh, the, the what we know about the Kingdom of Belgium, uh, um, then what can we say about it in the connection, for example, of royal versus patriarchal uh, struggles and connections, and then later on, as this kind of consolidate, try to see what happens between the different military orders. So I think the challenges shift the, the theoretical conceptual yeah. model. I, I think remains. I, I suggest. I just want. We talk, uh, Ron, Ronnie has been with us in all sorts of ways over the last days, but yeah, I think back to Crusader Castles and modern histories and, and the way he kind of, in that book, you know, periodizes within 1099 to 1187, you know, particular pressure points of theory and which we want. It would be interesting to see as your know, thinking on this develops, whether that kind of subcategorization of periods maps onto anything you're looking at in the, in the visual art. Well, I, I will tell you the truth. Um, my book about Crusader art is about to come out in perhaps six months. So, and um, I, I haven't tried to do it uh, to, to see the changes chronologically, but to take very many uh, uh, case examples to this process and to this theoretical model and um, to examine them in light of the different, um, of the changing challenges, the foundation lectures, things. And, but uh, I would certainly want to think the evolutional um, or the chronological aspects of this, of the implication of the flexibility model. To think of. So, thanks. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm also very, very attracted like William to the concept of flexibility of interpretation. But I'm also wondering about the bigger question of how the concept of representation is created in the Holy Land, like for art, I mean, for iconography. When you have, for example, uh, Charlemagne's schools, so you have a center and there's, you know, there are specific styles that you can identify clearly with the, with the past school and, and, and the manuscripts and so forth. But it would be more difficult here in the Holy Land when you have different artists working, different traditions, existing remains, um, I think more decentralized, perhaps. So my question is, how do you imagine that it works? How is the idea of this hybrid or flexible 
kind of I don't know but you know, how is it created and how are these transported or simulated from one place to another? Thanks. Yeah, also, great question. Um, um, <laughs> uh, there is a huge debate among uh, medieval artists uh, historians about the tensions or the, the the work processes between patrons and artists. Where does when we think of agency, where should we place it among the patrons or among the artists? Um, and my approach tends to place the agency more um, uh, strongly on the side of the patrons than on the side of the artists. Um, and, I, and having said that, I would suggest that the patrons in each specific uh, site, uh, uh, and certainly in the major uh, holy sites, uh, uh, would, uh, I would look for there for, for, there for the patron as uh, a source of agency and not not negating uh, the importance of the um, the artists but I think the selection of of um, subjects uh, uh, I would find it hard to believe was left out to the artists to um, to select and to to plan a cycle um, and I've I'm not uh, referring here to, to, to style. I avoided, if you uh, notice, I avoided the term style uh, uh, completely in this paper. And, and uh, you all know that the, the long historiography of the question of uh, uh, Western artists and the, 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 the groundbreaking uh, uh, work of my, 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 of, uh, my mentor, of Nurit and Kedar, about the local character of crusader art. And, um, but I'm, uh, looking for the, the, the moment of decision-making. What do you want to say about yourself? Or let's say it more bluntly, what power do you want to obtain when you choose to plan a cycle, a, a narrative cycle or a monumental cycle and invest quite a lot of funds in this decision? So um, not, not to say that style is not important. I think the style is extremely important. And I think that the, um, decision which artists, which workshops, which artists to to uh, invite to come and uh, and execute work in a, in a site is extremely important and is a political and identity forming decision as important as that of which, what am I going to portray? I, I had a debate once with uh, um, uh, Dennis, with Dennis Springle about the Byzantine uh, character of the, uh, the murals in Abu Ghosh. Why are they so Byzantine? And I suggested that uh, the Byzantine nature is a declaration saying something about, the hospitalers are saying something through the choice of such Byzantine iconography. And, and uh, Dennis disagree, I'm not comparing myself to Dennis Springle, I'm, you know, <laughs> prostrating at his feet, but, but, but uh, we, we, we look differently at, at, this, at the intentionality of stylistic decisions. Thank you. Uh, this is sort of a follow-up. With, with your with your theory, are you like does it work as well with monumental art as it does with like personal art? I, I'm thinking about the the icon I think that Andrew had in his presentation with you know the like the small icons that people could just pick up or buy or pilgrim you know with like you know, the book cover of Melisenda Psalter right. and, and, and so, others. So do you see the flexibility there working working there as well? Um, I would say, I would say that uh, it works better for monumental cycles or, or architectural idioms and their selections, uh, as monumentality um, implies or uh, not implies suggests um, multiple audiences, um, while uh, minor arts often tended to have specific. Um, uh, of intended, intended viewers. Um, however, I would um, I would use the term flexibility in regard to minor art as well, uh, since there we would think about flexibility in terms of 
let's say, um, the, the um, a recipient, for example, of a gift, if you think of Melisenda and Fulk and so on, and the, the, the giver of a gift. Oh. Mm. So the flexibility works there a little bit differently. By the way, um, Anne, knowing your work about the Muslims, and then, then I think the flexibility model works, I think, uh, perfectly with the kind of uh, how should we place the Christian Muslim relations within the Latin Kingdom. So the, I think there is things to gain when thinking with this model in this term as well. Thank you, Gil. It was fascinating. Uh, thank you for your I must uh, add and follow up on what Anne also asked. Uh, the, the, quest, the notion of flexibility works wonderfully with pottery that is produced in the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem. And most, I think uh, also in uh, regards to the forms and to the decorations, if this is pottery that's produced in Cyprus, or the so-called course uh, Indian ware that uh, was produced in the 13th century. So to continue also William's question, in the in the 13th century in the pottery, you definitely see this flexibility, this use of different um, um, images. Some of them can be Western, like a Western knight or an Eastern person sitting on the floor with his legs crossed and wearing a Eastern kaftan. But these things were found in Crusader Acre, both the Western style and the Eastern style. So I think that uh, this um, notion of flexibility, really, you can see it also on the uh, ceramics. I don't know if you could call it really art, but these are the everyday, vessels that people are using and it has a huge audience and it also is reflecting something so we should talk about we should this talk. <laughs> uh, and along those lines you have the bronze vessels which are the narrow bit and that and that's just just to add one one thing to the, the debate about western or, or eastern um and, and referring specifically to McEvitt's, um the question that he raises about um, Crusader states. I mean, one of the one of the, I think, problems with with his argument is that he's presupposing or seems to be presupposing a rather monolithic model of the West there. Um, and of course, Sebasta is a very good example um, of how varied the audience um, for how very the Western audience for a monument like that is, because um, we know that, of course, it's, um, as Nuret Kamal Kadar showed, very heavily invested in by um, French patrons. Mm -hmm. But we also have, um, of course, from the Icelandic program of Nicholas and Spera, very soon after um, it's the, the, the cathedral is started. So it, it's, and, and, and of course, they, so, so there are very different kind of Western traditions and um, and, and sort of West, uh, a, a, a multi multiplicity of perceptions as it were in the West for um, a, a monument, a new monument in the East, which I think both shows us the importance um, and, and the uniqueness of what's going on in the Holy Land, the only place that can sort of appeal to, as it were, this, this kind of very uh, varied audience, um, but also should, I think, give us pause in thinking about a straightforward kind of crusader equals west and therefore we shouldn't use the term. Any more questions? Yes. It's uh, actually this deeply important theory making. I just asked bluntly that why doesn't Mary have Gloria in the capital of Nazareth? Is it there? And I just can't see it because it's striking to me that the that the uh, male saint is having Gloria, but then the female figure is this is not, maybe it is there. Let's see. Because you know he, he seems to be a little reluctant to follow her. The devils, there's a woman, and then there's male saint who isn't happy really to um, be taken. 
I, if you are referring to, to the posture of the, of the male ascent, um, but you know, interpretation, interpretation of gestures and of posture is a risky, risky. Uh, it's an unbiased no, story. No, it's sorry. just an intriguing image. Um, well, the uh, if you if you think about how this uh, posture was interpreted in in historiography, for example, then um, uh, we have. Uh, uh, notions of uh, the frightened, the frightened uh, mis uh, apostle, the fi frightened Christian community being led to uh, to uh, uh, safety. So, or the uh, frightened pagan, like the scale of us, for example. So, following, yes. um, but but again, um, uh, and and when we interpreted postures and, and gestures, then we also we uh, we risk the. the uh, entering a place of ambiguity because the interpretations of uh, uh, gestures is uh, often ambiguous, but I think I would I would say that this ambiguity allows more room for the kind of the elastic, elasticity of such um, of of this uh, uh, image. Now, if you your your initial uh, question about Gloria, yeah, uh, I would I would say that. Um, it, uh, I think that the crown, she's, she's crowned. Mm -hmm. Then the idea of Maria Regina or is, mm -hmm. is, is probably to be accentuated, accentuated uh, here. Uh, May I add one thing? I do believe, I'm not sure that this is the Virgin Mary. Some historians or art historians do see it as the church leading mm -hmm. the people away. And if we think of the fact that in 1170 the church was rebuilt after the bishop was sent a letter claiming that the Nazareth and its vicinity is in a very bad situation, and unless we get help, we will we'll not be able to continue serving in the area. So I think it has to do more with the fact that this is the church and the bishop, and this is my church, but in the people who are very afraid. Of course, but if you're in a, in a, Maria, in a Marian uh, shrine, you would uh, uh, go back to Maria as Maria Ecclesia. So it's not a, a, a binary um, distinction, but uh, I would say a, a nexus of, nexus of, of uh, as, as, uh, associations of level, level of meaning. Okay, I think uh, we'll round up with that. So once again, that And uh, our second and final speaker is Dr. Wally Cox. I'd like to mention him, one of the most knowledgeable people in the field. And he possesses what I regard as consent authority for any scholar, and that's from Jim Gary. Every time I meet him, he excitedly uh, informs me from uh, one of the discovery. And his passion is tangible and effective, and, and I think that's quite important. Well, his research represents, there is represented in numerous publications, uh, and is an example of how uh, even when specializing in a specific object, whether it's ceramics or coins or whatever, um, the, the possibility of learning about different aspects of, you say, the history and, you say, the Culture is very broad indeed. The publications deal with uh, such topics as coin circulation, seals, lead tokens, the cost of building a church, uh, I think the manufacture of wine. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> um, uh, forgeries, hoards, mints, mint and mint process, and so forth. So many different aspects of, 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 of topics. Here. Of interest. Um, is the title the title of the paper today is Towards a More Inclusive History for that means material culture studying money and coins in the Kingdom of Lisbon from the 13th century. Thank you, Adrian, for these very warm words. Um, I feel my my lecture's been made easy because we had this very knowledgeable and deeply um, methodological um, lecture by, by Gil. And I, I would like 
I would like to to um, keep this word, um, keep what what we talked about flexibility in our minds when when you see what I'm basically giving you here today is sort of a descriptive lecture of what we have in terms of money uh, in the kingdom of Jerusalem during the 12th and 13th century. Um, first, a couple of words about Ronnie, of course. Um, I met Ronnie many, 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 many years ago. And, um, well, almost 40 years ago. And um, I remember sitting with him in uh, Benny's class and um, Ronnie was um, um, older than us, more mature than us. Um, I think he already thought it out, um, the, the whole multidisciplinary approach of crusading. And he went for it with, of course, with uh, Benny's, uh, Benny's uh, help. And um, he's greatly missed. Um, coins are the most plentiful objects um, uh, made in the Crusader states to survive to the present day. Minted in the principalities of Edessa, Antioch, the county of Tripoli, and the Latin kingdom of Jerusalem and Cyprus, thousands of coins have survived and to be found in collections around the world. Their study allows aspects of economy, identity and trade to be explored, as well providing insights into rulers' relations with their subjects and neighbors. Starting in the uh, mid 19th century, important public collections of crusader coins started to be created, concentrating um, on identifying and publishing different type of coins from the Latin East, their variations and their series. Then in the early 20th century, we saw the publication of hordes and regional studies. And finally, in recent years, the more recent systematic publication of previously unavailable isolated crusader coinage from controlled archeological excavations in the heartland of the kingdom of Jerusalem has proven to be an important tool to explore the circulation of different types of coinages of the Latin East. Now, I just want to give a couple of important um, basic concepts because we're talking about money, but money, I mean, coinage is not all money. Coinage is only a very small aspect of basically of money. We have these three uh, important concepts. There's barter, there is money, which is a physical object agreed upon as a medium of exchange. It could be any object, sell, sold or silver. And of course, there's the final, the final coin, standard measured piece of metal stamped with a symbol of inscription, which is with us basically since the um, um, sixth century BCE for almost 2,700 years. So these are really three important basic concepts when you deal with money or coinage. Um, just to give you a small, a small, um, a small view of how unimportant coinage is actually. <laughs> um, 200,000 years ago, we started with barter and then 4,400 4, years ago, uh, we have the use of cattle and grain as a, as a means of exchange. Then around 2000 BC, silver starts to be used as um, uh, a means of exchange. 600 BC, the invention of coinage in Asia Minor in Greece, and Greece. Um, the Crusader period, very small period uh, over there. Um, the use of paper money in Sweden, 1661. The invention of the credit card in 1946. And nowadays, of course, we already have no money anymore. <laughs> <There's> <laughs> iPhone, yes. yes. I pay. Um, a little bit about the medieval economic, what I call the medieval economic iceberg. Um, again, money is, when we talk about coinage, is only a very small part of the entire medieval economy. Most of the medieval economy is basically barter and labor. And when we talk about money, many times um, we talk about uh, the use of ingots, um, pieces of silver that 
people take with them on the Crusades, um, or even when we talk about the 13th century in, uh, in Venice, a lot of uh, the money was transported in, in, um, in the shape of ingots. We have very, very, very few of these ingots survive in, 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 in museums or in, in, um, in collections. And basically what we left, of course, is, is, is the coin. Just to give you a basic understanding of coinage, before the Industrial Revolution, 90, 99% nine, zero uh, of coins were, were minted by hand using an upper die and a lower die and in between a flan. And by hammering the upper die onto the lower die, you would create a coin. So this was the, um, the most important, the dominant uh, way in which coinage was produced before the introduction, of course, of uh, um, industrial type coinages in the Industrial Revolution with the steam engines. Again, money. We think about money as an economy, um, something that is uh, value, but um, many different societies have different ways of thinking about money. And this is a, a wonderful example of, a, of money from Micronesia, which, which, in which the value of the coin uh, is added by rolling it from house to house over centuries. So, um, and I just wanted to, to give this sort of, I would say, crazy example to, 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 to show you that, that money um, also has different aspects, not just the aspect of um, 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 economic value um, and I, I want to show you this coin which was found in one of our excavations in Acre by my colleague who's sitting here Edna Stern who was excavating a wonderful uh, a hoard of spoilia in uh, the 13th century for Boer of Montmuzal in, in Acre and this coin was found and dated the spoilia this coin, um, when I identified it, apparently came from Moravia. It's totally unique. We have very few coins from Moravia, from Bohemia, probably one or two. And it shows you that um, sometimes coins um, have no economic value in terms of what our study of the, econo of the economy of the Latin uh, East, but they show us the connection of different populations and different communication lines, yeah? lost footprints of groups and populations like the Bohemians of which we know very little. And Benny published a, a wonderful uh, article about, uh, about the Bohemians uh, that came on crusades and settled in the Latin East. And here's a material evidence, very, very rare material evidence of this kind of uh, connections. Um, now, in contrast to the traditional numismatics uh, of typology, iconography, there is a new numismatics, which is based on provenance site, which allows statistical studies. Um, I can give you a, an, an example from the study of uh, Greek and Roman coinage from excavations, which show that the rate loss of coins in a site averages about um, 0.20%, which means that for every coin, every coin loss represents about 5,000 coins in circulation. And this allows us to construct models of coin circulation based on coin finds or coin losses. Of course, one has to take account that these are usually heavily biased towards low value coins. Yeah, When you excavate, most of the coins that you find are not these wonderful, beautiful gold coins, but these are the silver coins, yeah? or not even the silver coins, these are the bronze coins. And secondly, of course, in the medieval period, um, coins often functioned as a store of wealth. So it was quite possible that up to 20 or 30% of the total amount of minted coins sometimes were herded or locked in a treasury. When people started studying crusader coinage in earnest at the end of the 19th century, they had a, a very Eurocentric 
Eurocentric and, and romantic vi vision um, of these of these of these coins. Yeah, and this is a wonderful quote from Gustave Schlumberger, um, who wrote the most important uh, work on Crusader coinage until it was superseded only in 1985 and 1995. Uh, and, uh, parler de ces fait en Syrie et sur les bords de we want to speak about these frequent discoveries that are made in Syria and even on the banks of the Euphrates of coins belonging to our former kings and barons of France. And um, um, so, in fact, the study of coins, then, like other works um, on crusader charters, architectural castle building, was part grounded in the revival of medievalism of the Romantic movement and part grounded in colonial aspirations in uh, Syrian Lebanon in the 19th century, I'm talking about coins. And these coins illustrated the participation and the presence of the illustrious uh, crusader dynasties and personalities and showed the connection of the important historical links that bound France and these parts of the Ottoman Empire it coveted as colonies. Mm -hmm. And so erroneously, many 19th century and early 20th century historians and numismatists thought that this great eastward movement of armies and pilgrims was accompanied by a, a, like a, a large flow of such of, of Western money. Now, part of the problem was that both historians and numismatists until quite recent read too much into the written source material while having no access to more empirical evidence based on excavation material from provenance sites. We have, for example, um, the chronicle Raymond of Aguilier, which mentions in his chronicle the use of coins of seven mints of the First Crusades. And I put them here in a slide and co convinced many historians and numismatists that these coins played a major role in the monetary economy of the First Crusade in the first 40 years of Frankish settlement in the Latin East. And this was until very recent. Yes, my, my mentor, uh, Michael Metcalf. Um, however, this view that coinage from Europe based on the thin silver denier coinage, weighing Gwen Graham, and you see, which was introduced by Charlemagne, more or less played an important role in the, in the uh, part in the Crusades and the settlement in the economy of the kingdom must now be regarded as outdated and does not reflect the economic realities. What really happened, and again, I, I would like to think about flexibility, what we talked about in our previous lecture, is that with the first conquest and settlements, the Crusaders or Frankish settlers adopted the local monetary systems that were in place in the Near East. This meant that the first crusader states established in northern Syria, Edessa and Antioch, areas which until very recently had been in the orbit of the Byzantine Empire. I remind you that the Battle of Manziker and its aftermath with the loss of Anatolia in northern Syria was just barely a quarter of a century earlier, were inspired by medieval Byzantine monetary traditions. Like contemporary Byzantine types, these coins were made of large bronze flans, and also their iconography often resembled the Byzantine type folis or large bronze coins which appeared with saints, Christ Pantocrator, Mother of God, yeah, Maria Theotokos, but often with original crusader adaptions, and this is important, showing bearded, or helmeted warriors and monograms with abbreviated Latin inscriptions. And we see here another example of these hybrid Greek and Latin types and inscriptions. Um, on, the on the left, Tancred of Antioch with a Byzantine inspired headdress and holding a sword and cross, while on the right, Baldwin II, dressed in chain armor, a conical helmet, and an inscription. Now, as the Crusader armies moved south after conquering Antioch, 
the local population threatened by reprisals or wholesale slaughter of its population started to pay large sums of ransom in the form of gold money. Many of these instances were recorded in the various Latin chronicles and Arab sources. These practices also continued immediately after the Crusader had established themselves in Jerusalem during 1100 and 1101 under both Godfrey and his successor, King Baldwin I, when the Fatimid population of Ashkelon, Caesarea, Acre and Tyre agreed to pay a ransom of 5,000 Byzants, these gold coins, every month in return for peace, according to the Chronicle Albert of Aachen. So we have a well overwhelming material evidence of, <laughs> of this gold-based monetary economy in the territories associated with the Crusader conquests and settlements. Um, shown by a large number of hordes whose dep deposition dates are clearly associated with the Crusader conquest of Fatimid ruled Palestine. They, more than anything else, showed the money these first Crusaders and settlers encountered and adopted. Here are some examples, like this ceramic purse uh, containing a um, mix of dinars and small gold fractions, money typically used for daily transactions discovered in a commercial and industrial area abandoned just before the Crusader conquest of Ramle, on June 3, 3rd, uh, 1099. Of these gold treasures, gold, dinars, and jewelry, uh, um, and um, this is another um, uh, one of these treasures uh, discovered in Jerusalem. Actually, it's three hordes, which were found according to um, what I have by the latest information near the Gulle Gate, south of the Temple Mount. And, and we know of, of the, um, the quite dramatic uh, um, um, depictions of the, uh, the conquest of Jerusalem, while um, the Crusaders uh, breached the walls in, in the northern part of Jerusalem, we have descriptions of how the defenders, uh, when they heard that the, the, defend, the defenders, um, the, 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 tower, the sorry, the um, defenses were breached in the north, they basically um, evacuated the entire defenses of the south and moved back into the um, uh, temple into the uh, um, area of the uh, um, Tower of David. So these were what I could, what I would consider uh, hastily abandoned or abandoned hordes. Uh, um, this is a treasure of uh, gold dinars buried during Baldwin's conquest of al Suf, a strategic uh, town uh, barely a, a year later in 1100, which resulted in the wholesale expulsion of its inhabitants. Um, it was found in the castle, which was built in the 13th century, but in terms of the coins, it's a typical, typical hoard, which dates to the um, um, late 11th, the beginning of the 12th century. And here, um, another hoard which was found in our uh, Caesarea excavations, not yet published, consisting of a rare mixed gold Byzantine Fatimid gold money treasure associated with the Crusader conquest of Caesarea of Baldwin in 1101. Um, and this is one of the few times we ever discovered Byzantine gold among these five convex shaped uh, numisma of the Emperor Michael VII uh, Dukas, the late 11th century. And um, many of these hoards contain coins of, um, I would say, very rare coins of the, uh, um, the Fatimid Caliph Al Nustali, which um, is exactly the period that the uh, Crusader conquest takes place. And this is very important dating material for us. Thus, 
the transformation from an exclusively silver-based monetary economy in Europe to a, a gold-based monetary economy here in the Middle East was extremely, extremely rapid, as I already showed you. And, um, and we also see this wonderful quote of Fulk of Shard, yeah, in, in which he says, consider, I pray and reflect how in our time God has transformed the Occident into the Orient. For we who were Westerners have now become Orientals, and those who had few coins here possess countless designs. Yeah, and of course, another quote much later from William of Tyre, who reminds us of the enormous amounts of gold coinage that basically came from the Fatimid Caliph into, um, into the uh, Kingdom of Jerusalem. So um, the gold dinar of the Fatimid dynasty was adopted as the basic currency, both as cash, but even more important as the dominant coin type in which calculations and accountings were made. This is important. And we see, really, we see in the hundreds of property charges in which prices and rents are mentioned, these are mentioned in terms of Saracenatos Byzantios. Yeah. Indeed, beyond the available supply of Fatimid gold, the kings of Jerusalem themselves minted their own gold imitation dinas, um, which had lesser amounts of gold than the strictly controlled Fatimid original of 95%. Um, during the 12th century, we think it's 80%. And then in the 13th century, it becomes even more debased, 60 to 70%. And of course, you can see also what is so, so wonderful to see in these coins, the, the barbarization of the inscriptions, which tell us, of course, interesting stories about who were the minters or who were not the minters? Mm -hmm. um, so this led, this led by the 1140s in the Kingdom of Jerusalem to the creation of a monetary system that monopolized minting of coins to the exclusion of other feudal lords, which is, well, if you look at France, that's quite revolutionary because in France, you would hardly be able to distinguish between the coin of a French king and the coin of a French feudal lord. There was no, there was no way you could see the difference. But in the kingdom of Jerusalem, as we still see, we, we can really see. And these are like, we talk about flexibility. Uh, flexibility is, I would say, is quite a revolutionary concept. Um, Archaeological and numismatic finds show that the monetary system created by the Frankish settler was in fact more complex than the documentary sources reveal. It consisted of at least three additional denom denominations below it. The use of small cut gold fractions with Latin, le le uh, Latin legends and symbols, which was basically a Frankish takeover of an Islamic Fatimid monetary tradition originating in the cutting up of silver dirhams in the 10th century, when there was no copper small coinage anymore available. In addition, um, so this is the standard Western coin type. And just give you an example of um, Conan II, Duke of Bretagne, who appears also in um, 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 but what I want to say about this coinage is that in Europe, in Europe at this time, there are standard immobilized types in use for literally hundreds of years, like this denier of, of Conrad II, Duke of Bretagne, minted in Rennes. In contrast, the deniers of the kings of Jerusalem chose to depict in a highly unorthodox manner two monumental structures, both highly symbolical and realistic at the same time. The Tower of David and the Holy Sepulchre of Tunde, specifically designed to enhance the legitimacy of the new Jerusalem dynasty by associating with the biblical kings of Israel and their patronage over the Holy Shrine of, Holy Shrine of Christendom, 
And these coins are possibly the earliest example of a well-designed uniform territorial royal coinage system in the 12th century, with the exception, I would could say, of uh, the, English, the English kingdom, much earlier than, for example, France, the alma mater's kingdom by some 70 or 80 years. The Amouri Deniers, sorry, the Amouri Deniers, which we saw in the previous, um, um, were the most prolific denier coinage in the territory of the kingdom till 1187. And this is part of my, my research. And analysis of archaeological material like this hoard found on the body of a dead Templar who died in August 1179 on the frontier castle of Vadum Yako, which we excavated together with Ronnie and Adrian and many others. Um, and from more than 60 other sites collected over two decades by me, show a wide distribution of coins that the kings of Jerusalem jealously safeguarded the standard weight and ally of this coinage. From the 1140s onwards, we see, like in the kingdom, the simultaneous introduction of Western denier types in Tripoli and Antioch. And this is very interesting. This starts in the 1140s, everywhere. Especially the one to the right, the, the, the series minted in Antioch are huge. They're massive, massive um, uh, numbers of, um, which were minted over 100 years but they do not appear, hardly do appear in circulation in the kingdom of Jerusalem. Back in the kingdom, the monetary system changed in the 13th century as excavation sites of Adlit and Montfort Castle constructed after 1217 and 1226 show with the influx of Cypriot money. And again, I would like to stress how important excavations are to get a real picture of what was circulating and how the coinage developed. Without these excavations, on the left, Atlit Castle, which was excavated in the 1930s by Jones and currently excavated by our colleague Padlit, uh, and to the right, the excavations, which were started in the 1920s and which I could say is Adrian's life work, uh, Montfort Castle. We, 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 we got wonderful material that can illustrate us what really happened in the 13th century. We also see the arrival of a large number of foreign coins, particularly French coinage in the 13th century, together with the Cypriot coinage. Coinage from um, Burgundy, coinage from, uh, from Sicily. And this coinage from Sicily is not only connected to uh, the, um, the um, arrival of Frederick II. I think it shows a basic connection also with Sicily. And what is so interesting, almost enigmatic is the virtual absence of non-French coinage, besides the coinage that I mentioned. And this is a fantastic um, find, just recently identified we, um, near Ibelin, near uh, Yavne, Tel Ibelin, where we are, are currently doing huge excavations, mainly uh, of the Byzantine and Umayyad period, but the, the Tel, the Tel is Crusader and um, recently studied um, by Benny, Benny Kedar. And we find this coin, this very rare coin from Friesland in Holland, eh? the bishops, bishops of Utrecht. Um, as far as I know, there are only two, two Dutch coins that I've ever seen. Um, one now in Javne and the other one in Apollonia, and that's it. And, this is a really an interesting question. Why do we see so few coinages of, um, of um, those contingents which are not coming from France? 
um, <clears throat> we see, um, at the same time, we see the indigenous royal coinage degenerated in the 13th, beginning of the 13th century, ending with the enigmatic um, Damiata coinage minted by John of Brienne, the last real king of Jerusalem between 1210 and 1225. Um, a lot of scholars think that these coins were minted in Damiata. I, I start to doubt this. I think these coins were probably minted in Acre, but uh, we'll have to talk, we have to write about this a little bit more. Um, we also see the embronic uh, development of a feudal baronial coinage quite late in the kingdom, in the 13th century. And again, um, these are coins which were excavated. Um, to the left are Sur Castle, which we're going to publish now. And to the right, extremely, extremely uh, um, rare coin minted in Yafo, in Yafa, which was actually uh, excavated in a crusader context in Yafa, which is quite extraordinary. <laughs> Um, below all this, there's a variety of small lay lords that produce their own let coinage, token money. Um, a monetary tradition imported from Western Europe, which did not exist in the East. And this local struck underground let money formed an integral part of the cash used by the Frankish settlers in many of the cities, towns, and rural estates in the Latin East during the 12th and 13th century. And again, without excavations, we never know about this, never know. And what is so interesting about the uh, lead tokens is that this is really a West European tradition because there is no lead token tradition in the monetary system in, in the Near East, in, in the Islamic East. Um, Why is that? So no, no lead? There is lead, but they don't, they don't, they don't do it. Um, what is so interesting also that many of these tokens have inscriptions on the, on Belmont, Subban, we have a large hoard of some more than 400, I think more than 480 um, tokens, which were found in, 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 uh, in the castle of the, uh, of the, uh, of Belmont Suba, Suba near Jerusalem with uh, the inscription Pom, Pons, yeah, um, bridge, or maybe a name. As you know, uh, Iris, it was a very uh, um, common name. Exactly, exactly. And um, even more enigmatic is um, three, three tokens which were found in Al Sur. And it, um, from the latest material, from the latest uh, um, um, excavation material that I have, I, I thought this token was from the 13th century. It might be from the 12th century even. That would make this one of the one of the earliest examples of an object written in in Utremer French. But let's see. Um, but what is interesting, of course, also for people that are dealing with, with script, I mean, we're using, we, people are using here um, um, scripts uh, which were used in, in um, in people that dealt with scribal traditions that related to the 12th and 13th century. Um, we see in the Frankish settlements from the mid 1150s to the 1250s, the circulation of local Islamic coinages, Zanjit and Ayubid coinages, copper coinages. Copper coinages are reintroduced in the Middle East after an absence of almost 300 years in the early 12th century, in, mostly in Syria and trickled down. Then later on, a of course, ad uh, adopted by the Ayubids. And finally, in the 1260s, um, and, and then we also see, of course, sorry, uh, in the 12th, in the, in, 
in the first half of the 13th century, we see the introduction of heavy Ayubid good silver dirhams and their Frankish imitations, minted in the first half of the, of the, of the 13th century. I mean, good silver coins are introduced around the 1160s by Salah Adin, and they become more and more important during the 13th century. And they become so important that copies or, or imitations of these coins are minted both in Damascus and in Aleppo. Sorry, the imitations are minted, the, the coins are originals are minted in Aleppo in Damascus, and the imitations are minted in, in Acre. And we even have imitations, these wonderful imitations with uh, Christological uh, um, inscriptions in Arabic. And finally, in the 1260s, we see um, a large silver type coin, the Gros minted in Tripoli to your, to your right, which is minted in Tripoli until the Mamluk uh, Demis or uh, uh, the Mamluk's conquest in 1289. And, and these large coins imitated the silver Gros coinage introduced for the first time by Louis IX, King of France in the 1260s. So we see also reverse processes of coins that are reintroduced from the West into the East. Indeed, um, we have rare epigraphic evidence for the existence of a Tour de, Tour de Monet, Tour de la Monet, Tower of the Mint in Tripoli. And this is a dedicatory inscription discovered in the city's harbor in 1928. And it mentions in the, the building or restorations um, of its ruler, Boimont VI, of the mint of the commune of the people of Tripoli. Um, this presumably it is decorated a tower of the citadel or at the main gate, which functions simultaneously as a mint and a custom house. And probably it housed the mint where the silver bro was struck. And this is basically my, my introduction to you, my, my, my presentation. And um, hope you liked it and I'm willing to help the questions. Thank you. 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 It's an important question. I'll tell you honestly, we don't know. Probably in the beginning, I think <coughs> the very fast adoption of gold money meant that these processes went very, very quickly. People immediately started using the local, let's say, the local gold coinage. Um, People try to build models that people who are exchanging money could be. I mean, um, I recently wrote an article about the um, presence of minters <clears throat> and people that were involved in minting of coins in the Middle Ages were often people that were involved in goldsmithing or silversmithing. And these people, we, we know of, of, of money exchanges that were situated near the, um, uh, we know this from texts that were situated near the, the Holy Sepulchre. I think these were the Eastern ones. Then we have the more West, the, the Western, um, the Frankish uh, money exchanges, with, which was sitting um, near the, um, the Street of David, where we where we walked uh, a couple of days ago. So, so apparently, of course, people came with money, and in the beginning, there was a need for, ex for to, to, to be exchanged, and probably this became more and more important in, from the 1140s onwards, when in 
in the Crusader states, basically um, the rulers sort of um, instituted a kind of monopoly of um, minting their own coins. And this is a phenomenon that we also know from Western Europe. Okay, about the first question. Um, there's, a pro there's a very interesting process going on here suddenly um, because in the Near East, in the Islamic Near East, around the uh, 9th century, suddenly copper coinage disappears. We don't know why. Some around 850, copper coinage disappears. And then this process starts of um, how do you pay? How do you pay in, in small, in small uh, fractions? So people start cutting up coins. And then in, in, in the beginning, people start cutting up uh, silver coins, silver dirhams. And this process is, I can't say that it's like a chronological first silver. I always thought it was first silver and then, and then uh, gold. I still think it is a little bit, but we also see, we see, I'm working on a Abbasid period hoard of the ninth century. And, I, and there also I see uh, uh, people basically cutting up uh, 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 dinas, uh, Abbasid dinas. But I think on the, on, on, on the whole, people start first cutting up silver. Later on during the 10th, 11th century, it becomes, as gold becomes more and more important, people start cutting up gold coins for small payments. Yeah. Well, the answer is proper. I, I, okay, okay, I can understand what you're getting at. Well, I must say that during 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 the Fatimid period, during the let's say the um, the end of the 10th century, 11th century, silver becomes less and less important. It's more and more gold. I mean, it's it really is a gold economy. And when you when you also when you look at the at the Gniza uh, documents, you can see that people um, people um, mention basically only gold coinage, very very little uh, silver coinage. So gold is very important. About the second question, I didn't really understand what you were getting at with the. Where the silver is coming from. Yeah. Again, I, I think during the during the 10th, 11th, 12th century, as uh, beginning of the 12th century, silver is not important in the Middle East. So it's it's I don't know if it's such a relevant question. Um but we know that by the second half of the 12th century, there's a lot of silver coming from Western Europe into the Middle East. Um, so that's that's a flow that got, goes from West to East. That's the that basically also allows Salahadin Saladin to start minting his heavy dirham coinage. Yeah, probably yes. You know. Big, big silver mines in the hearts. Um, I don't know much about, I must say, I don't know much about the, the flow of silver from, from these. There's also a lot of silver in Anatolia available. Um, silver is, it's interesting because for example, we have in, in the ninth century we have these huge amount of silver which flows out of the Abbasid Caliphate and which you will find in Sweden. So, so, so these things change all the time. 
Yes. Um, I was interested in what you talked about, the adoption of, of existing monetary systems and dirhams. Is there any evidence of Frankish coins in, say, Damascus? Uh, it's a problem because I think this is a, a, a research problem. I'm sure there is, but um, there's nothing published. No. I mean, there's or, or very little published. Um, this is this is this is a big problem that I have with with my research. I mean, I don't know what, I don't know what's happening in Lebanon. I don't know what's happening in Syria. I don't know what's happening in Jordan. There is hardly any material available, no publication. It's um, it's problematic. If I may, uh, luckily we have uh, written book with documentation, and uh, this we can read even if it was published in the last survey. Book. And uh, there is, uh, for instance, uh, an official who probably lived in Tiberias after its conquest by Saladin, and he rules that Frankish money shouldn't be used, which of course means that some people did use it. Yeah. And uh, then in the 13th century, we have a roll that was found uh, in Egypt, where you see a sizable quantity of Frankish uh, silver uh, imitation dirhams. So this is uh, uh, less widely, no uh, widely known among Israeli scholars, maybe because it was published in an Egyptian publication. There is the kind of, uh, let's say, of, well, how should I call it, local patriotism, <laughs> that uh, you deal, uh, you tend to deal with uh, local uh, excavations, local laws, and it's very important, but I should also beyond the curtain. Uh, and we have a peace treaty with Egypt, you know, since 1979. Yeah, it's, it's true what Benny says. Um, there, there are fields that are still, I mean, there are still that still have to, be, have to be done. For example, this whole field of silver, silver Frankish limitations, the work still has to be done. You know, Michael Bates started it in the 1970s, wrote an article and that's it. I mean, it's not enough because he was he based his material basically on, on uh, well, on, on collections, but nobody, nobody continued this work. There's a lot of work that still needs to be done for sure. Um, any more questions? Yes, thank you. Um, Robert, I, I thought it was really helpful the way you started by differentiating between money and coinage, <laughs> and reminding us that coinage is just one expression, material expression of, of money. And I just wonder whether I can invite you to sort of flip that a little bit when I'm thinking about the Crusader coinage. Yeah. Uh, we only to think of crusader coinage as money, or are there other ways in which a coinage would acquire different types of function within, uh, particularly, uh, you know, I'm thinking about coins bearing the iconography of a sepulchre, uh, and so on. It's just your thoughts on that sort of thing. Yeah. I, I, I really, really use this. Yeah, yeah, no, I, for example, I, I really love, I really like what Michael McCormick wrote about the coin, the way he dealt, the way he saw, the way he deals with coins in his research. I mean, he, he shows the point of our art, like, show connections between people, show connections between you know, or the, the, the movement of populations or, or, or goods, or it's, it's a different way of looking at coins. And maybe it's, maybe, maybe because there are so few of these coins like, available in research, I think it's a, it's a wonderful way of looking at coins. Um, of course, the yeah, the study of, um, uh, of you know, the coins are are um, interesting platforms. You think the calligraphy, the inscriptions, and I must I must say, you know, very few historians use the evidence of coinage in their research. I don't know why. 
I have no idea why. I mean, I'm. I mean, I. It's, it's it, it perplexed me because I'm an I'm a I'm an historian. I, um, I was raised by by Benny. I started working. <laughs> I started working for the um, um, for the um, for the Israel for the Israel Archaeological Service. I was sort of a strange guy there, you know. I'm a historian. We're all archaeologists, <laughs> and um, but. So I, I'm sort of a hybrid, you know, I, because and, and I, I feel that it's very important to use this kind of material, not just for numismatic research, you know, like deep numismatic. I mean, coinage are such interesting platforms for information about a lot of things. Just from working with colleagues in the Museum of Morris and Dolly London, yeah. they've got quite a substantial collection of recited coins. And a polysepulchral coins, the Amore coins that we show. Yes. And one of the things that I noticed when looking at the coins is that the pattern of wear on the iconography of the Holy Sepulchre is quite significant. Now, there could be all sorts of reasons for that, but I would speculate that it's an amuletic function and that it's, a, it's wear acquired having you know, been robbed. But you know, that's a speculation. Mm -hmm. But I think it points to the different ways in which you. Coins might function within the society. Yeah, I, I mean, I wrote in my in the doctor that said like the appearance of the holy sepulchre rotunda on a coin is quite revolutionary. You know, I mean, a monumental building on a on, on, a, on a coin. Look at Western coinage; you won't find you won't find something like that. I mean, so, and again, I, I return to um, the concept. That Gil talked about flexibility and the adoption of certain things, or, or the, the the readiness to adopt certain certain iconographic um, um, designs on on coin. It's it's quite it's quite interesting. Does it stimulate emulation in other Western? Kingdom, to be. I, I don't know about Western coinage at all, but, but, but how, how, how far did that representation? Well, I just wanted to sort of like piggyback on that. Um, I, I'm thinking what you're saying about the, the representation of a monumental structure. We see that, I, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, on Western coinage in the representation of cities, but much later, yes. right? So I, I was just wondering, following William's comment, if, if you can think about how. This monumental representation of, of the Holy Sepulchre, the Tower of David, is sort of a metonymic uh, idea of Jerusalem, um, then um, inspires the similar notions in the West. I'm thinking about um, uh, Keith, Keith uh, Lilly's book, City and Cosmos, where I think he uses that, um, uh, those representations of, of cities on coinage, um, like as part of the argument that this is based on, on ideas of heavenly Jerusalem and its depictions in um, other kinds of media. Sorry. Well, it's, uh, I, I'm less knowledgeable about this, but, but for example, the, 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 inscript, the, the inscription of the king of Jerusalem, everybody wants to be king of Jerusalem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, right. Yeah, Frederick, uh, all Everything that he had, all the all the the also wants to be king of Jerusalem, and the, the kings of Cyprus also want to be king of Jerusalem. So uh, that's one of the one of the um, maybe one of the ways in which it shows the importance of the transference to other coin or cultures. It's a it's a wonderful example. Uh, Thanks so much. Uh, I wanted to ask you because I noticed that the, uh, the absence of the genius Venetian and Byzant coins. Sorry? Mm -hmm. I noticed the absence of the genius uh, Venetian and Byzant coins. So, which seems to uh, me quite curious because of their role in trading. Mm -hmm. So, why? I don't know if you choose not to put them in your, in your presentation or if we don't bad factor. Genoese coinage is really absent. It's really yeah. enigmatic. So why is so it's it's quite curious. Difficult question to answer. Venetian coinage is different. Venetian coinage um, appears later. We have a lot of Venetian coinage that appears in the 13th, 14th century, 
15th century. Um, I'm currently now busy publishing a hoard of gold and silver Venetian coinage from the excavations at Hukuk near the Lake of Tiberias, which is a mixture of Mamluk, Mamluk silver coinage and Venetian silver coinage and gold and silver, uh, sorry, and gold Mamluk and gold Venetian. So that's 15th century. We also have from the 14th century. Very little from the 13th century, very little. I mean, the Grosso was invented basically at the beginning of the, of the, of the, uh, of the 13th century, um, basically connected to uh, the Fourth Crusade, to pay for the Fourth Crusade. But in terms of fines, we 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 don't find that much Venetian coinage. Genoa, no coinage. And Pisa, Pisa, yes, Pisa, no, not not from Pisa, but we have the coinage from um, from Luca. <laughs> We, we, we have a lot of coinage from Luca, which was an important coinage up to the 1180s in that area. And apparently was used by, by, by the merchants from Pisa also. But again, I, I think being a person that works with coins, coins are also sort of myopic because Probably, as I said, most of what we know about trade and it was not wasn't paid in, in, in coins. Coins are only a small fraction of the actual means of exchange that we use. I think one, I think one, we have one, something. that's from the 11th century. So. Sorry? No, no, we, we, we don't see that. It's, it's not, no, no, we see a lot of coins from, uh, a big group of coins from, what is a big, uh, from Luca, uh, in Northern Italy. And we see uh, quite a few coins from Southern France, from Valence. These are two, two groups of coins which are um, which we do find in 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 sites in, in, in connected to the to the Crusader period in Israel. This has been this, is, this has also been shown in 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 board evidence earlier by by. Scholars in, in in Western Europe, Michael Metcalf and others. Maybe the absence of a Genoese uh, coinage uh, is also rooted in the fact that there are no excavations uh, in the Genoese street in Acre. Uh, or only in a small part of it, and also in the initial quarter of the first excavation. So, maybe it's maybe it's out of the Also, entire all excavations in the initial quarter. Yes. I was just curious about the end of each other to end with this. Why, why are they so beautiful? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you should ask Ed, Ed now, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> one thing, there was one coin with a hole in it. Why was there one of the coins that was shown? Yes, and they didn't know. Yeah. Okay, uh, well, you know, coins are sometimes used as secondary. Um, in secondary use, uh, um, either as jewelry, yeah. and then in, in the Middle Ages, you also had this interesting phenomenon that people, you know, would demonetize something and then remonetize. It. I mean, you know, it was it's because maybe people had a different concept of money than we had. You know, I mean, coins are so freely available for us. Think about it. You know, I mean, the billions of coins. I mean. Uh, in circulation right now, 
In the Middle Ages, it wasn't like that. In the Middle Ages, um, there were very few coins available. Um, coins were minted for for military purpose, to, for payment. Yeah? And, and then when people lacked coins, they minted these uh, lead tokens to be used as an additional means of exchange. Um, Again, what are means of exchange in the in, in, in the kingdom of Jerusalem is, a, is an interesting an interesting subject. It's a very interesting subject, and um, coins are just a small part. Of it. Round up the session. I just, I just have a few words. Uh, um, minutes. Uh, first of all, there was a feedback form sent to you by the institute. We would really appreciate it. Uh, fill it out and give us your feedback. Positive so, feedback. Positive feedback. <laughs> <laughs> in order to drive you very well. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Children. <laughs> 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 And there will be more food in the class outside. But before that, it's not a kind of food. Yeah. Yes? Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah. White guys with brown hair. We all look alike. So I'm just going to say a few words of thanks on behalf of the PhD students and the PGRs. And um, so first and foremost, I'd like to thank the Israel Institute of Advanced Studies for very kindly and generously hosting us this week, but specifically to Iris, Yanni and Anna. Um, this week has been absolutely fantastic and the level of organisation and work that you've put in has, has not been lost on us, specifically trying to board a bunch of crusade historians around Jerusalem and an acre is definitely not an easy task. Um, but obviously these sites, we don't get to see them every single day and so for me and I think for the PhD certainly this has been surreal so thank you very much for that and um, for all the speakers as well and um, thank you for all your fantastic papers but also for being so generous and um, with your time with us and so open to our ideas and, and giving us that really positive feedback that's been really invaluable and um, but for me personally the highlight has been actually getting to meet my fellow PhD students and ECRs I suppose by the very nature of our work, it's it's very isolating. So we don't really get to interact the way like scientists do by playing around in a lab. Um, so it's really great to kind of share that enthusiasm and, and share that passion. And also as well to kind of share those worries and concerns that we all I think have going through a PhD process. And it certainly reiterated to me that like, you know, we're all in the one boat here and we're all sinking. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but no, I think we've genuinely made some fantastic friendships and I think that is hopefully going to, to strengthen and progress uh, over the next few years. Uh, and the drinking really did help consolidate. <laughs> um, but I think with that in mind, and finally, I, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn here, um, but I think it'd be very remiss if I didn't mention uh, Ronnie Allenbloom. Now, sadly, I didn't have the privilege of knowing him, but certainly from listening to, to everyone here that did know him, he was very influential in instigating this, this school. Um, and sadly, he didn't see it come to fruition. And uh, I think we all owe him a massive debt of gratitude for, for bringing us all together. But specifically, I just want to reiterate, uh, Iris, Yanni, Anna, thank you so, so much for, for persevering. And again, as I saying, bringing this through to fruition. And if you'll indulge me, as we, we say in Ireland, we're going to meet a meal of the air and shop and in Tukshaw. Uh, thank you so much for this wonderful week. Uh, well, follow that. Uh, uh, Iris <laughs> uh, has given me the, the, the privilege of saying a few words of uh, including remarks as well. Uh, and 
Ronan has very much captured the spirit of what I wanted to say. Um, uh, it's been a really fantastic uh, few days. We've had an opportunity to hear from historians, from art historians, from uh, numismatists, from uh, archaeologists who've learned about material culture and so on. It's been uh, so stimulating and inspiring uh, to hear about uh, you know, research in various fields of uh, interest and from such world experts. And I think just to echo what Ronan has said about the other thing we've had the chance to do is to, to see, uh, to smell, to hear the places that so many of us study. And that's really an opportunity that it will be, for some of you who had the first time to do it, and I hope it'll be the first of many, wandering around Jerusalem, wandering around Acre, you know, it's, it's uh, there's nothing quite like it. Um, and I think we should all be so grateful for the opportunity uh, we've had. Um, I really hope, and I think Roland's captured this already, that you found the week's discussions every bit as interesting and rewarding as I have. But I'm also really grateful and glad to hear what Ronan said about the opportunities you've had to meet and get to know one another. Because the thing I really wanted to say is really to come back to what Professor Kadar was talking about on Sunday in terms of tips uh, for researching crusade studies. The one thing I would want to add to that list is always remember the importance of fellowship. Um, you know, Jonathan showed us yesterday that photograph of me and uh, him and Iris and Ronnie and uh, Netta uh, in January 2018, where we were talking about, you know, we had lunch together and Ronnie was pitching this idea of uh, this event today. And yeah, there are people in this room who knew Ronnie much better than I did. But I know from that conversation and other conversations that I have with him that fellowship and collegiality were qualities that were, you know, essential uh, to Ronnie. And I like to think that we, we honour him and have been modelling that um, between us uh, here, colleagues and you know, people in this room I've known for many years. Some people I've only met for the first time this week. I hope this will be the first of many, many occasions where we and you get together, talk with one another, enjoy one another's company uh, and learn from one another. Because as, as Ronan says, this is a collaborative uh, effort that we're engaged in here. And I think, you know, I, I've heard other colleagues say this in the past, but I think there is something distinctive about our field is that there is a particular uh, esprit de corps if you like, among uh, colleagues who work in our field. And I think I've really felt it this week. Um, I'm sure you have as well. Uh, so uh, two things by way of wrapping up, just again, to thank so much, Iris, Yoni and Anna. Perhaps you could join me. Finally, just to wish you all very safe journeys home, whether that's 10 minutes down the road or uh, <laughs> 10 hours on a plane. Uh, have a really good journey home, safe journey home, and I really look forward to seeing you all again here or elsewhere in a similar setting very, very soon.